beauty creates a need for nothing more. It is complete. And all who wish completeness find it in that sweet store. Why should they think to see the shaded child hid beneath? For beauty has a need for nothing more than to be seen, or heard, or felt upon the tongue, upon the inner breath, or else be lost and never last. The child starves. And beauty to itself may well be blind, never, may never hold within its eye the gaze that leaves the passing stranger so amazed they leave no arms, feel no need to be kind. Starved or full, beauty's face denies or feeds, gives nothing to the giver, asks for nothing from the finder, and both are left the poorer. Unless they share their beauty with each other. Beauty, beauty creates a need for nothing more than to accept it within one's own store. Hello, afternoon. That was a poem called You Too Are Beauty. A meditation upon it from seven years ago now. A number of themes in it. They how beauty in many ways is seen as a surface thing, and those who are beautifuls, generally beautiful, marketable beautiful are often seen just for the beauty and not for anything underneath, hence the child starving. There's also something very much projected onto other people. They are the beautiful ones, I look at them and they are beautiful. I would suggest that part of that interaction should be, could be, perhaps already is, an acknowledgement that beauty is something shared. If I see their beauty, true beauty maybe, I'll see something of my own. That's why it's called You Two Are Beautiful. That's how rather You Two Are Beauty. That's one of the themes that's, that winds its way through a number of these poems. Beauty may not be the right word for it, I'm not sure. I'm talking about that feeling that beauty can engender, both in the desire and in the scorn and in the sense of rejection, if you consider yourself not to be the beautiful one. Perhaps even the insecurity, if you generally consider yourself to be one of the beautiful ones. It's certainly something that seems to be bestowed by others, and so the one who has beauty bestowed upon them may well feel kind of powerless. And so learning to switch off that projection of to detach or I'm not my own personal desire, perhaps, for somebody beautiful and just see them regardless. That's one of the themes in this one that I was learning. 
I was learning how to walk beside beauty when beauty did not want to be seen, when beauty had things to say, to hear. I was learning how to welcome beauty to my home when beauty needed a place to sleep in shade out of the floodlights. I was learning how to see beauty in a glass in the shape of one, my shape unnoted by my host, by the person walking at my side. And again, I re-echo that, that sense of beauty. We are, others dress us in beauty, it seems, in that kind of beauty. Leaving something unseen below the surface, flows away. All the beauty they dressed us in, I wanted it. I want it still, like a waterfall falling eternal. Adoration lands like a waterfall thumping like thumbs into skin with no grip it pours away again we catch at the new like a breath the old is so downstream make a splash hide the rock i was never the light shining on me yes there's a rainbow over, under, the pool is forced into deeper shadow. Perhaps that's one that would have fitted in the set I did not so long ago on glamour, on glamorisation. So there's beauty as one skin. This poem is a poem about another skin, often worn, again with a child beneath. It's often my worry that short poems don't necessarily have the time to be heard when you speak them. If the, the, the advantage that page has is that you can see it, you can go over it, record it, but when it's spoken, it's said perhaps very quickly and gone. So part of the challenge in this is to get you kind of ready to hear what I hope is in this. So I mentioned this is another skin worn. This time I'm talking of a kind of armour, a kind of shield of protection. Take us from Heck was later on it comes up again, the damsel and the knight. It's called a poem called A Child Beneath the Shield. Child Beneath the Shield. I thought it just a battle cry to carry skin into the metal mill and iron clash to bring bone home. But one battle's end, as he let me bind and gather up the blood from the floor, I saw, upon his arm, beneath the shield, and heard the mouthing of a hungry boy, round belly, kicking legs, and a reaching paw. I 
and there, this next one there. What happens when those skins are removed? You've removed your clothes, all of them. Then you've done something else. You've stood in your hair. I do not move, not even in blood. Your skin slipping over the air. My eyes surrender, I hear instead, feel as a breath, knowing, all striving gone. At some point knowing to reach for you, give in to your grace, not waiting because here it is, all, you arriving, me finally surviving, beauty as, just the beginning, the giving, beauty as the way through to something you have always known, something I have always known, an infinite number of eternities caught in the nakedness of your hand, caught by your naked skin on my eye, caught by your taking away everything that might keep you from me. I do not move. I am moved. I am given in to your grace. Standing, I am kneeling. Exultant, I am prostrate on the floor. Dying into life, torn into perfection. I am barely able to breathe as I reach to the buttons that hold me, dare to take away everything. I'd like to read now a longer poem, which I think I have read online before some time ago, perhaps sometime last year, which picks up on some of those themes. It's a retelling of a story out of the Arthurian cycle of knights and damosels, the sort of stories that I grew up with 50 years ago. And I feel, while I love it as it is, there's also a sense of something old fashioned about it. The binary of knights and damsels can be off putting, I know, for some, especially if you tie it strictly to night, male and female, man and woman. But it's always struck me or at least it struck me at a very early age, that in such stories we're talking about ourselves and parts of ourselves, just as I believe that we're all masculine and all of us are feminine, and we each choose to which degree we manifest those things. So we are each of us knights and we are each of us damsels, as ever we choose to be. 
So I'd hope you might want to take it in that sort of context. It's a fairly true rendering of the story, um, but my own version of it, I guess. It concerns Gawain, the Knight Gawain, um, who sometimes is known as the Knight of the Goddess, and the damsel, the Dame Ragnall, also known as the Loathly Lady. In the story, she is famously described as this hideous, misshapen person. This judgment put upon her. Not a beauty thrown on her, but quite the opposite. And so there are themes of beauty and ugliness. There are themes of um, body shape, how you relate to your body. Judgments put upon you by others. There's also a very strong sense of thread of self-autonomy and it being able to choose for yourself. And Gawain in this might be seen, I hope, as a kind of compassionate side of ourselves towards ourselves. So this is Dame Ragnall, or the Loathly Lady and Gawain. And it's in five parts. Part one. In sack and ties the lady loped. Her stricken groom held to her side. And how the court of Camelot in terror stood. And horrified their sickened faces sought to hide. Perhaps they of their sovereign Hoped King Arthur he would so decide that peerless Sir Gawain should not be forced to wedlock sanctified this loathsome damsel for his bride. The dress could not be found would fit the twist and falling of her shape, nor cover modestly her back. The tangle rising to her nape, grey silver as the fabled ape. Nor any crown or bonnet, sit concealing net or veiling drape upon her head, to hide the stack of sprouted warts or drooled escape of dribble from her toothy gape. And no respite could any have through scented cloth or basil leaf, no incense flung from holy urn, nor perfume offer aught relief from smells that rose behind her teeth. The dark and blister-bounded cave, or lipped about with bruising beef, emitted forth enough to churn a dragon's gut, a breathless thief of hope, and deepest held belief. At service end, the throng's relief, coldly wed to retching grief. The dame had holp the wretched king upon the road in dire quest, had told the secret, keenly sought, the answer that would save his crest. What is it? Women love the best. Arthur's charge was find the thing that women may desire most, a treasure that might not be bought, the answer he had never guessed. He gave the wish she from him pressed, the boon he granted, much distressed, a husband held against her breast. Forlorn the king had faced his court and spoke his obligation clear, the oath regretted, rashly made, a knight betrothed within the year, the monstrous damsel drawing near. Though many had with ogres fought and trolls, their faces stretched with fear to see the visage of the maid, the dangling eye. Her pallor drear, the waxen tresses in her ear, 
the scabrous nose, the greasy smear of snot, the ghastly remnant leer. A silence fell, a latent jeer, a grimace hid, a court severe. My lady said upon his knees, Gawain alone, his face sincere, if it will make you glad and please, before my friends and brethren here, wilt take me, lady, for thy dear. Part two. Her lumpen breast and corky dug drop as raiment was released. Queen Guinevere, as her handmaid, bowed, ensuring all a bride could need, and for her comfort paid her heed. And ladies, too, to help her lug the threadbares of her stained chemise, and as a forest step from cloud expose her belly to the breeze, Drooping otherwise by her knees. A bath of water warm was near To bathe her face, her thigh, her feet, And pliers brought to trim her nail, And shears to prune her thatching neat, All hung with courtly smiles sweet. From eyes they wiped the roomy tear, and sharing glances so discreet, flicked eyelids at her stubborn tail, while snatching stories to repeat when scaring husbands from their meat. At Queen's command they made retreat, just Guinevere left to turn the sheet. And gazing at her counterpane, the face that naught of beauty had, a maiden on her wedding night, in tremors of unknowing clad, waiting silent for her lad. She shared then a smile sad and left her with a good night bad. We lay at first one hundred breaths, my bulk and him upon the bed, untouching, stiff upon our backs, two pious statues of the dead, and neither one would raise our head. Then, like one in unhappy death, he turned and in the darkness said, My lady wife, A marriage lacks, Unless with closeness it is fed, And layers of cold distance shed. His hand of power firm and red, He lay then on my skin of dread. A hundred breaths we further lay, his hand and warmth upon my side, Like golden sun in heat of day, Upon my tanned and leathered hide, The shadows of my pox did hide. In time I felt a ripple play, Uncalled for, like a turning tide, As winter fallow come to May, and yearning with deep terror vied within my belly, sagging wide. My lady wife, might you abide my shy embrace, my tender pride? Around me then he wrapped his arm, stretching to the furthest reach, and did not shy from holding firm this Sea cow stranded on a beach, 
this slimy and blood-guzzled leech. Then for a hundred breaths, this warm and shaggy limb, a ragged breach within me made, an eager worm to touch a bruise and mottled peach, an answer to my torn beseech. His mouth began a song to teach, a music plucked from each by each. I felt his kiss upon my cheek, breath playing on my whiskers there. I shuddered out my hundredth gasp, thundered longing mixed with fear, and then, upon my griffin's beak, he lay a keen, unflinching stare, summoned an unyielding grasp, brushed aside the straying hair that moles had flung into the air, and leaned his golden smile near. My blisters raked across his lip, my spittle smeared upon his chin, my toothy gaping found his tongue, my clammy fingers found his skin, my bosom wrinkled in his grip, his pinch upon my nipple thin, and where my folding belly hung he ran his hands beneath within a hundred breaths. And so begin, my lord, my husband. Enter in. Part three. Sunshine makes the bleakest waste seem beautiful. The giving light reflecting on the sharpest thorn. But nothing so awoke my sight as dawned upon our wedding night. Still half in sleep, I gently traced the edges of her forehead bright, all care and trepidation shorn, free of nervousness and fright, dispelled by troth in mutual plight. Her soft enchantment held me quite, I reached again and pulled her tight. Part four. She lay there, still as fair as any giant's wife, or white of May, and slept a slumber fathoms deep beneath the careful ways of day, till waking sloughed it all away. Then leaping upright, fraught with many fears, she cried, he made a say to calm her, heard his lady weep, great heaving boulders of dismay, stones of sorrow, jagged lay, my wife, may I your grief allay, wherefore? This curse of sorrow, pray. Who gave this curse? A witch, perhaps? My father's wife? I cannot tell. With malice held in looks and lies, Who, clad in secrets, Spoke the spell and caused my body first to swell, To awkward curves, Abhorrent paps, with fur, an unrelenting smell, and skin that, as the desert dries, in dunes and stretches, rough as shell of crabs within the cockle's well. Beneath enchantment forced to dwell, a troglodyte and creature fell, with all endearments to repel, my face become my sentinel, the ringing of the wedding bell alone to bring the riots quell. By wedding me, the spell you've broke in two, and only half remains. That half of time, in seeming fair, I'll walk the court, and free of chains can dance to music's kind refrains, but list, 
the last enchantment spoke, that half of time my beauty drains to furrowed looks and pitch despair, to tattered skin and angry veins, the target of the court's disdains. The glamour's force my choice constrains to bow to what your wisdom deigns. My husband, you have pledged to take and hold me safe, despite my mien, or coat of sense, or lumbered form. The worst now of my body seen, I fear the best already been. The choice is left for you to make. By day, a fair and lovely queen, as slender as the forest fawn, to glad the court, to flaunt and preen, but come to bed, a thing obscene. Or would you, for our marriage sake, to keep your flinted fire keen, within our chamber, soft and warm, a beauty hid by starlight sheen, but loathly go from dawn to e'en. Part five. A hundred breaths or more he stood and gazed into her stormy eye, now clear, now clouded, black then blue, Poised to let hard lightnings fly and crack apart the blistered sky. With roaring thunder, sundering flood and rage of her hail. Or else decry her only worth, her marriage rue. Both fair and foul within her vie, all joy and horror in her sigh. What answer would his love belie? What doom to dwell in his reply? The shining of your heart imbues my knighted life with rigid hues. And yet to state mine own confuse, it saddens me the light should lose, would have me pitied through the day by each the pretty queens of me, or set me butted in their games, their fearful laughter at my shame, to bear the scorn and earn the blame of every jealous lord and dame that I should curse the kind Gawain, to blight his joy and kindle pain, my hopes of freedom burnt in vain, and I tormented once again, I would not have my words obtuse, nor leave you fated to abuse, for all a jealous witch's ruse should make the smallest side glance bruise to cage me with the sun instead, in fear of nightfall's heavy tread, my beauty by the starlight bled, and all the love of daylight time fled, to reach our chamber door with dread. My shape undone and beauty shed to find within a greasy bed my husband's ardour lying dead. Better to have ne'er been wed than have these furies in my head, nor have you so imprisoned. A flaunted thing or clipped recluse. My answer must remain unsaid. He is no knight who would reduce the freedom of the one he woos. Your beauty, when and where to use, beloved, tis for you to choose. Silence, then. A ringing still. As foxes hear the hare's breath held. A weary and expectant while she stood there, 
like a giant felled, and gleaming as an oyster shelled, a pearl unfeeling, tearless still, like sunlight through a mist dispelled, a radiance broke out through her smile, through her eyes her beauty welled, and all her native grace beheld. The curse removed, the truth expelled, that beauty full within her dwelled. The thing that women desire most, tis said, is but to have our way, but more, to feel we own a voice, and it be heard, that each can say that this is who I be today. My sovereignty will not be lost to any earless Husband's sway. Your gentle heeding of my choice. Through storming of my heart's dismay. Has torn the curse's teeth away. I choose in fairness to remain for always. With my kind Gawain. Dame Ragnall, or the lovely lady and Gawain. Thank you for listening through that, if you, if you did the whole time. I'd love to know what you think. What I'd like to do now is three fairly short poems. Still touching a bit on beauty. But in specifics with the beauty of age. And I've no idea whether she's watching or listening. But I would love to dedicate this to Alex, if she's watching, because it's a birthday. So these three poems before the end. The video for this will be on the timeline after if you want to catch up or watch again and I'll be doing more the day after tomorrow and I'll put the set list in amongst the comments shortly as well so thank you very much for listening these are the last three beginning with C it's in the creases around my eyes where the skin sardined to make room for a smile. Where my heart's crash of laughter made mountains, made ridges, made county downs, made gentle ripples in the ground. Where flesh made folds around eyes half closed, eyes squeezed tight in a welcome hug and a gathering up. Spent so many hours Glaring at myself, finally daring. It's in the corners of all corners of my eyes, amongst the creases, all my beauty lies. Antique face. As long as you don't expect youth from me, you will have my beauty. This old drawn skin, time pulled it tight, let it go loose now, walks with your touch, doesn't bounce back, empty folds. Elasticity is lost, 
saggy pants worn at the knee, patched still with dignity, speak of long service active in the war against gravity. Let them lie with you, with a little warmth just detectable by an old hand, thin-ribbed, delicate hip, all this age being new, unknown, still there to explore, little meat upon the bone, what remains, antique lace or thinly veiled, it has another beauty all its own. With age. Your beauty slipped, you say, beneath your skin. I could reach my hand, place it on the soft and where you let it through, warm pinches there like a ripple through a tear, touch that most deep, mature appreciation of all that beauty is, which younger hearts can never feel nor bear to carry. Skin deep it was, but you are deeper now. And if this older apprehension tells the truth of all beauty tries to be, if this heart that has loved and burned and grown into a stronger thing and has the metal now to bear it bravely, then beauty you were still too young to bear, shows now, in older years, abundant, clear, 